James, the second chapter, the first 11 verses. I have it in the bulletin of the papers I passed out. I'm using all, all new, new international version, uh, version of this morning. Mainly because there's two of the passages that I wanted to use that are better explained or closer to the uh, original text. But I, I, the thing that James deals with in this passage of scripture, my eyes are very blurry right now. I'm not seeing well. I don't know whether it's my uh, glasses I slip down or not fitting right or what. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to read the scripture as well like I had planned to, which means we might get out a little bit earlier. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out about that. But uh, the scripture deals with being partial. The uh, first part of this deals in the, uh, with a big problem within the churches of the first century. That of partiality, uh, favoritism. And uh, evidently there were people coming into the worship service at uh, that particular time. And they were uh, some of the people that were rich and affluent and had all things uh, that the rich have, where it be given the positions of prestige as far as the church is concerned. And the poorer people were given the poorer places. They would have to sit on the ground, or they would have to uh, uh, be sitting in the corner and things like that, and the rich got the favoritism and so forth. And the more I thought about that, the more I begin to think about our nation today, the things that are bothering me much in our nation, is the problems that we are facing as far as our thinking is concerned. Uh, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Uh, there's a big issue about the, the hatred and the disunity in our nation, the division within our nation. Uh, there, there is uh, people that still have not taken down their uh, political signs from uh, last election. They have kept up their signs. Uh, one of my neighbors, you go around the corner, still has a big banner up on his side of what he, uh, who he is for. We, we find that there, there's a lot of people that are hating Christians. And I think Christians are one of the most persecuted groups in, the, in our nation today, but that's here or there, near or there. Uh, and we see a lot of problems in our nation. And we'll talk about this a little bit later on. But the thing that I, I want to emphasize more than anything else, that I try in my relationships with other people, and I have to really work at this, of being impartial. Uh, I have, uh, in at least three ministries, I've spent a lot of time in jail, visiting with people that were put there because of crimes that they had done. Uh, and some of the crimes were uh, pretty bad. One was put in jail because of alcoholic, another was put in jail because he shot somebody. Another was put in jail because he molested teenage girls. But I tried to work with them, especially those that were Christian, and there was two of them, uh, all three of them had been baptized. Then I, I tried to work with them to bring them back into relationship with Christ. Uh, two times I was reasonably successful. I, I, I spent a lot of time working with the poor uh, and trying to help them uh, I remember one time when I was preaching in Titusville that we had a family come to the church and it was dirty. They uh, never bought any soap. Uh, uh, I finally started to use the teenage son to be able to send soap to the house, hand soap, so they can get cleaned up. He used to come to my house just to be able to wash hands because we, he had nothing at home to be able to wash his hands with. I went to call on them one time and they were having some problems and my uh, husband and wife were. The wife was a member of the church, he was not. 
And I kid you not that the cockroaches were so bad in that house that they were crawling all over me as I was talking to them about the church and their relationship to the church. I'll tell this because of your mature group. I went home that day right after I left their house. And I went in the house and I stood by the door and locked the door and made sure the blinds were done. And the mirror was right there. And I stripped down to my birthday suit. And I went upstairs immediately and jumped in the tub of hot water and scrubbed down for almost an hour after I was there while my wife did the uh, laundry for my the clothes that I was wearing. Afterwards, I went out with my salt spray and sprayed the, the car down in case any of the cockroaches fell down off me. But you'd be surprised at some of the things I had to deal with. I worked with the city council and the youth com uh, committee at two different churches. I was actually involved with uh, the police department in uh, Owasa, Michigan working with some of the criminals that were there. All these things are in the past when I had the energy and the ability to be able to do so. I'm saying these things not to brag or to boast, but to emphasize the fact that I have tried to be impartial. I tried not to favor one church member over another, while I recognize the authority of the leadership in the uh, submission of the uh, rest of the congregation. I remember one church I preached to, they were preaching was on vacation, they called me, I wasn't preaching at the time. They asked me to come back and they told me about the problems they were having with the congregation the, uh, and the eldership. And you're familiar with this particular congregation, by the way. So I went back and in my sermon, I emphasize the idea that, that one of the things I hear about the church there is that the uh, eldership is trying to control everything. Oh, most, but a lot of the members of the church just listen up and says, well, oh, here comes they're gonna get, he's going to get out of the eldership. They had that silly grin on their face, well, we've accomplished something. And I said, you ought to praise God for it because that's why you elected them as elders of the church. That's when the elders stood up and said, praise the Lord, he said that. And all the other people that were praying, glad to hear me say it earlier, sunk down in a defeated position. I don't believe I'm a, I tell people I'm a racist. That I'm very partial to one race. And that is the human race because it does not matter to me whether they're white, black, yellow, green, yellow, uh, purple, or what. God made of the world, the population of the world, of one blood. That's what Paul says in Acts 17. I wish, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm saying it in all humility and all uh, but also in, as in all sincerity at the same time. I wish that most people would have the same attitude that I have. I've had to deal with racism in a situation. I'm talking about the ethnic concept of racism in some of the churches that I've served. I was tried out for a church up in the northern panhandle, the east, west, eastern panhandle of West Virginia. And they were very proud of the fact that they were supporting almost uh, completely a, uh, a black church where they were paying the preacher, they were paying all the utilities and anything else that they uh, came up with, but they had the part, biggest part of the budget was that. I was tickled to hear it. I said, well, where is this church? Oh, it's just right down the block, about a block and a half from us. And I said, well, if you're that close, why don't you combine and have a stronger church and have a black minister be an associate minister with, with whoever you have to do? Oh, we can't do that. We believe in the separation of the races. I said, well, you're talking to the wrong men, and I don't know about this congregation. 
we're in big trouble as far as our nation's concerned. I hear average Heisman coming over from King's Daughters Hospital of Donna National. We're stronger together. It all depends on what we're together on, as far as I'm concerned. Because if we're together on the concept of sin, we're not stronger. If we're together on the concept of being uh, a racism, we're not stronger. If we're together because of things that are contrary to the word of God, we're not stronger. We need to be together on the right things before we can be stronger together. But just for a moment, let's look at the passage of Scripture that James talks about. Uh, the first few verses deals with the idea of the rich and the poor. James emphasizes the idea that that you uh, uh, that the rich and the poor. Uh, this is found in the first four verses. Uh, that the rich discriminates the poor in their society in which they live. He, he, he tells, he says that you are, uh, are believers in the glorious God uh, and uh, Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Don't show favoritism. And we, we go on and say, suppose a man comes to your meeting dressed in fine apparel, Riches, rings, and jewelry that men wear. You give him the best place. Poor man comes in, you give him the worst place. He says they're rich because they abuse you. They extort you. And he goes on with that. The second part of this passage, verses 5 through 7, deal with God's concept of the poor. God has chosen the poor to be the receivers of the gospel of Christ, uh, to inherit the kingdom of God that he prepared, that he promised him. The idea here is the, uh, that God wants the poor to have the blessings that he can give to them. I think one of the reasons why he chose the poor is because they will have, have been more open to the faith and dependency upon him. I think another reason is because uh, God realizes that uh, the poor are being extorted by the, and being abused by the rich and so forth. But the last portion I like, and I want to spend my time on here. If you really keep the rule of law found in the scriptures, he says, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they do. I don't. But I love them. I don't agree with everything the Roman Catholic Church says. They do a lot of good. My best friend in Corbin, Kentucky happened to be Roman Catholic priest. I wish you would have seen the number of hours that we spent discussing the differences between the church. He knew where I stood and I knew where he stood. But every time one of my family was in the hospital, he called them, had prayer with them. I appreciated that. We met one time on the uh, uh, interstate in a rest stop not realizing we both were there when he was coming out of the rest area and I was going into it uh, and I looked at Roger and said, Roger, what are you doing here? He said, what are you doing here? And we, we got to talk about and we talked about the while we were there I was coming back from uh, or going to a church that had asked me to come for an interview he was coming from a funeral with a family member. And Roger looked at him and said, Phil, he says, I know we don't agree. He says, but let's have prayer together. He prayed for my visit with this particular congregation. I prayed for the comfort of the Spirit 
to be his. You don't have to agree with everything. But realize that the person, even the worst person that ever walked the face of this earth, was created in the image of God as we were. And that God loves them and gave Jesus Christ for them. And right under the idea of this passage of Scripture, while he, James is dealing with the partiality of the rich and the poor, our nation is divided on race, nationality, education, and position. Every one of these can be a sermon within himself. And we need to realize that God loves everybody and he's not willing that any should perish but have everlasting life. Now the rest of my notes deals with the related scriptures. Go home and read these scriptures. I don't have the time. But let me run down. The first one I have there, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22 deals with a similar problem that Paul dealt with in the Corinthian church. And about their agape feast, a feast, fellowship dinner that they would have prior to their worship service. And he was telling them that they were not having it correctly. The second one that I have, the first, the first 15th chapter, verses there is uh, my fifth chapter, verses one through five, where Paul urges the Corinthian church to disfellowship, not have anything to do with a man that was living in incestual, incestual relationship with his father's wife. And Paul tells them that you need to come uh, uh, disfellowship from them. And I had served two churches where we exercised that principle of disfellowshipping from somebody that was doing wrong. The third one, 2 Corinthians, the sixth chapter, verses 14 through 15, Paul tells the church to come out from among them. What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, with good and evil, there's no fellowship. Be not unequally yoked with them. And then Paul in the 17th verse of that says, come out from among them and be ye separate. That's showing Partiality, partiality. But we need to do it. We need not be associated with that which is evil. Next one is 1 Timothy, 1 chapter, verses 18 to 20. Where Paul says he's uh, turned over to Satan, Hymenaeus and Alexander, that they may learn not to uh, blaspheme. The last verse I have there, Second John, the tenth, tenth and eleventh verses, only one chapter. If anyone comes in you and does not bring this doctrine, teaching, do not take him into your home or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. We have groups that are cults of Christianity that are not teaching the word of God, go from door to door. What do you do? I'll sit down and talk to them. They're willing to listen to me. But if they're not willing to listen to me, I tell them goodbye. I tell them goodbye. I've even had some take their shoes off and beat them against the house to shake the dust off them, which is something they have learned in Scripture. One scripture in this whole batch that bothers me. And that's found in our text. Where our text says that if you break one law, if you break one law, you're guilty of the whole law. Steve and I were talking. 
earlier. If we have one sin in our life that we have not confessed and asked for forgiveness, are we guilty of all? I'm not sure. I think oftentimes when we come around the Lord's table, and it means something to me, I have to say sorry. I'm about sorry. I'm sorry for anything I've done wrong. Even those things that I don't realize are wrong, I hope you forgive me. Because I don't want to be guilty of everything that is contrary to the Word of God. You think about that. How great it is to know that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all wrong and we should live in love one with another. Let that be your message. We're going to be singing a song of the day. But I can't remember what it is, Mary. Just as I am. Just as I am. If there's any here that needs to make a decision for Christ, we invite you to come. Mm -hmm.